He's an aspiring music engineer, mastering engineer, sessionist. Sessionist. I'm gonna start over. Crap. <laughs> <laughs> All right, today I'm joined by somebody I met over a decade ago. He lived in the Philippines two different times for a combined six years. He graduated from the Australian Institute of Music, graduated with a bachelor's degree in audio. Um, he's an aspiring mastering engineer, sessionist, guitarist, and producer. He specializes in funk, pop, and blues. He's worked with Nathan and Mercury, Ellie Swang, Bay Lorenzo, and many, many more. He's my personal audio guru. Nick, thanks for coming in. Oh, mate, it is a beautiful morning here in very unsunny Vancouver, Canada. Uh, we actually finished summer two days ago. And mm -hmm. um, yesterday, which was supposedly the first day of fall, we were greeted by like massive, massive amounts of rain, which we haven't had in yeah. like months. So it was yeah. quite, quite the, um, the wake-up call to our new <laughs> fall season. And it is, you know... Dark and bleak, but unlike me, I'm very happy to be here. So we talked a bit about this for the past few days. Um, you were mentioning to me that you have certain habits that you don't like. Or you have certain mindsets or viewpoints mm. based on what other people do to improve their craft. Mm -hmm. You've also given me tips. Can you share some of those thoughts that you were sharing about improving our craft in the digital age? Yeah, so I, I rant about this, not just to you, but to any other unlucky person to ask me, like, just a small question about a particular thing, Yeah. where they'll be like, hey, what do you think about, like, this? And I'll be like, oh, well, I'll tell you, and I'll just go for, like, <laughs> go for, like, years, and the guy's like, oh, 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 kind of thing, like, and he yeah. just, like, left the conversation ages ago. Um, but yeah, so, um, like we talked about earlier, learning digitally comes with a few detriments. Besides how amazingly convenient it is for us to learn our craft and to hone our skills in whatever field uh, yeah. using the online tools we have to us, uh, the internet can be very dangerous in terms of the three detriments that I talked about earlier, which is that we don't, uh, we don't necessarily uh, believe ourselves, we don't believe in ourselves, we don't trust ourselves, and we can't think for ourselves. Right. Um, or it, it, and it harms many of those aspects of personal development. So speaking from my own experience as, because that's all I can really draw on. Right. But like, uh, like from an audio engineering perspective, uh, so many people, in fact, I think the majority of people that I know learn their audio engineering online. And like I said, if you can, if you don't feel like the connections at school are worth the price that you pay, then that's where you're going to go. Um, and the saturation of knowledge and sources on the internet in this particular topic, especially, but for, but for any other topic, yeah. uh, is just, it's super apparent and there are, you can find on YouTube, on Google, um, on forums and stuff, a, a, a slew of information, or may I reword it, a slew of opinions mm. on, on the matter here and aspiring engineers, artists, entrepreneurs, designers, whatever, have such a wealth of knowledge at their disposal that they tend to become super impressionable. Like we tend mm. to become super impressionable and ignore our own thoughts on the matter sometimes. Yeah. Um, and like I said, we don't care to go to that second page of Google. I, I mean, I wouldn't go to the second page of Google, I but have, I mean, like I what I'm saying. I have not gone to the, to the second no, I've page never, of Google. I think at one point in my life as a meme, I think I went, but there's like darkness and despair there. Oh, for sure, once there. or twice in my life. Yeah, I was like, I'm going there's to like darkness five. and despair on the second page. <laughs> Don't do that. You like it? You like your your vision starts to change. The whole world starts to become like 5D. Um, but we become yeah, we become very impressionable on the subject and we don't tend to do further research ourselves into the particular methodologies or subjects that we find yeah. online. Yeah. Um, so to just the first point, which is, um, you know, we don't think for ourselves. Uh, I want to actually touch on a particular topic uh, about the minus three to minus six dBs of headroom. So Go ahead. for those of you who are not really, who don't really understand what I just said, mix engineers are under the impression that when they send their files over to a mastering engineer, and even some mastering engineers are under this impression as well, and should I, I should say aspiring uh, in either category, mm. but they will tend to submit their mixes, or when they finish up their mix, they will have it peaking, which means the loudest point of their, of their mix will float somewhere between negative six and negative three dB. You mm. don't necessarily have to know what that is, it's just a particular value. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. It has to be between negative three and negative six dB. It has to be. 
Um, and some mastering engineers won't accept anything that's not there for some godforsaken reason. Mm. So to me, for some reason, that particular standard has been echo chambered across the internet. And when I search on the internet, on forums and everything, there are so many people preaching. And even in my own experience in real life, um, I know a lot of people that will think that way. They'll be like, oh, uh, here's, here's my mix. Don't worry, I made sure it's like below negative three <laughs> and above negative six. Or like a mastering engineer will yeah, say that, yeah. oh, I can't accept this file because it's like above negative three peaks at like negative two. And they won't take it. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's frustrating because it's one of those things where that is negative three and negative six. So that, for the, again, for those uninitiated, that particular standard came from an, an age that wasn't digital. That particular standard of when you, how loud you should submit a mix to a mastering engineer came from a point in time where things like the Alessis um, multi-track machines would clip very, very harshly, which means to distort uh, mm. if you push too much into it. It would clip and distort in a very unpleasant way if something reached its particular threshold. So yeah. to be safe people would submit their stuff at about negative three or negative mm, six to give headroom for that okay. particular analog machine, right, okay. real life machine to not clip. Yeah. So then you can get a clean, clean sound out of it. Now, for some reason that echo chambered throughout the, the, the history of engineering all the way to this point in time where I don't think a single person I know in our generation has ever even seen an Alessis multi-track machine. I haven't, I definitely haven't. True. Um, and that, that's not the standard anymore. Like digital, in, in digital age, as long as it doesn't clip your meter at the very end, you can submit it with a negative one peak. You can submit mm. it with a negative nine peak. It doesn't okay. matter. We've, we've got so much. We've got virtually, as long as it doesn't clip, we have virtually unlimited headroom as long as we just turn down the, the, channel, in, the channel volume or the channel input fader. But yeah. again, that, and I won't hark on that for too long, but it's one of those things where people will, find an opinion online, get it echo chambered, and then suddenly it becomes gospel for them. And people don't necessarily do further research into understanding why that is. They'll just say, they'll just say, oh, negative three, negative six is the standard. But then they won't do any further research as to why. Right. Like, why is that? They'll be like, some people will be like, oh, it's like headroom and stuff. It's so yeah, like, yeah. you can get headroom for the mastering engineer. And then you're like, well, yes, but the mastering engineer can just turn your track right, down if you wanted right. more headroom. There's like no digital ramifications to doing that. Right. Um, but what I'm saying is that, yeah, so we tend, that, that's one of the dangers um, when researching information like that online is that you have to be able to take what you see online. Don't take it as gospel. You could take it as temporary truth if you wanted. Yeah. But you have to sort of go further into the understanding as to why yeah. that is. Like do your own test. Like, go go into a DAW, maybe test this out yourself. Like, if I submit it at, like, negative two and negative three, if I try to master it myself just for kicks, mm. does it make a difference? Can I, can, I, can I change something about it? Stuff like that, where you have to just be open to experimenting for yourself on particular truths. I think that's a good point, because even in the podcast, I literally research the same thing. Um, I researched on what DB should I be recording. And what did you, what did you find? Actually, that's a, that's a good, what did you find? What I you found find? people saying negative 20 to negative 30, which is wow. why I, I recorded negative 20. Well, okay. So negative 20, in fairness, negative 20 is not wrong. And I think we were talking about this a bit earlier. Yeah, as well. yeah, yeah. So negative 20 is not wrong. Um, it's quiet, but it's not wrong. Mm. Uh, in digit in the digital age, we have more than how many DB of headroom. I think we have like, if 96 dB at head, of headroom at one point and 128 at another. Mm, and I'm not sure, but go ahead. Uh, yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm trying, I was trying to figure out a way to say it in layman's terms, and I really can't. Basically, we have so yeah. much yeah, dBs yeah. we can use. I'm sorry, there's, I'm trying to put it in like a more general. range of... Yeah, of available decibels yes. that we could use, um, to put it very, very, very simply. And so if you record at negative 20 and you submit at negative 20, to be honest, I fine. Fine by me. Um, totally fine. You just bring it up. Uh, obviously, the quieter it is, the harder it is to get l louder because there is only a certain amount yeah. that probably certain programs or plugins can increase the yeah. volume level of. But that that even that is just a very like minimal thing, you know? Right, I mean? right. Um, and so that's just one example. So going back to the second point, whereas we don't trust ourselves, yeah. we end up not really trusting ourselves. Um, because the ease of access of information hinders our need to self-discover, we don't train up our individuality. Okay. So mm. what we are mostly in our particular field starts off as just a collection of the opinions of other people 
and that's what forms us. Mm-hmm. Like rarely when we start out, including myself, rarely when we st- rarely when we start out, especially for me, did I have a single unique opinion in my body. You mm-hmm. know, everything I knew and everything I practiced was because somebody else said that, not because I put it into practice or put something or I contradicted it in real life and thought otherwise yeah. for a long time. Uh, and this is very, very dangerous. Uh, we should we should try to avoid that as much as we can. Um, this becomes extremely detrimental to personal development, discovery, and calibrating your own skill set. Yeah. So, for example, I was talking to Carlo uh, Maglasan, the bass player for Slate Wolf. That's a shout out, by the way, Carlo. If you are listening to this, I love you to bits, and I will always <laughs> outscore you in Valorant. I will there you always go. outfrag you. Um, I love you. Uh, but we were talking about it, and we were talking about compression and the uh, ratio of compression. So okay. for those of you who don't know, compression is just a, um, a tool used in mixing and mastering to sort of bring the average level of a particular source closer together. So it's not super loud. It's not super quiet. It's just like leveled out. Um, and a lot of, and he, he says that his teacher, and I can attest because I've also had teachers and people on forums and stuff say the same thing, that like when you compress, let's say a vocal, mm. when you compress a vocal, you should try to do, you should do it gently, like use two to one or three to one, okay. um, three to one ratios, which means that for every 3D, uh, three, bleh, for every 3 dB, <laughs> for every, <laughs> sorry, I'm twisting my, twisting my tongue here, but that means that for every three that the level goes above, it would get taken down by one. Um, oh, sorry. For every one dB, it goes above the threshold. It will get taken down by okay. two dB. And so what's interesting about that is it's echoed throughout the internet and even in real life education that anything above that for a vocal is like, oh, you're going to be squishing it too much or mm. it's not going to be dynamic. Mm. Where in truth, like I, in vocal stuff and throughout history, one of the most... C- one of the most important and um, most recorded with compressor of all time is a um, is an LA seventy six mm. um, or an eleven seventy six. Sorry, and that has a four to one compression ratio minimum, and it's been yeah. used on records that you have listened to your entire life. Every single record that you've had probably has had eleven seventy six compressor on it, and that has four to one ratio mm. on vocals on piano on tambourine, on whatever, whatever the hell they can put, get their hands on and put it on. And so where is this, where is this like two to one is like, where, where is this coming from? Like, where is this like, you can't use higher ratios on vocals because it's not dynamic. Like, where is it coming from? It sounds great. It mm. sounds fine. And so what I'm, what I'm saying in that regard is that you can't rely on, you, I mean, th- th- that's their opinion. If they feel like it's too much, then by all means, more power to them. Like if you feel like four to one is too much for your particular vocal or your particular guitar track or anything like that, all the more power to you, don't use it. But okay. don't be afraid to experiment with something just because somebody else said it was bad. Like do eight to one, do 10 to one for all I care. If it sounds good to you, then it's the right thing to do. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, another thing that, uh, in, that, in that same example, I know a professor once told me, and this was like, Back in actually, this was back in music school. So even in okay. music school, you have to be very careful about the information you get. I had a professor told me that if you have to boost, if you have to increase the level of something more than five dB or six dB, I think that's what he said, then you should probably be doing something else in a different. Like the problem is not there; the problem is somewhere else. And I guess th- there's like a very small truth in that. But are you telling me that when I watched a seminar with Chris Lord Alge, who's a a very famous mix engineer. When I watched him boost a snare drum, 12 dB, so pretty much maxed out the mm. the console. If I saw him boost that, and it sounded awesome, are you saying that he was wrong? Like, are you saying that the mm. problem in the snare was not that? Because it sounded amazing after, and he yeah. stuck with it. And he's like a Grammy-nominated engineer. And I'm not saying that the professor is wrong, and I'm not saying that Chris Lord was right. What I'm saying is that you the amount of impre- the impressionability we get from people who say stuff like that really limits our own development of self discovery you know like you should discover for yourself what more than 6 dB sounds like and you should discover for yourself whether that is actually the problem or that is actually making it better yeah and 
that, that that's what I mean by that uh, this um, age of just being ac- having access to so much knowledge and so much opinions is that sometimes you create yourself based on other people's opinions and never really getting time yeah. to formulate your own. What about the people who don't have strong opinions on things? Where they just want the answer. They don't want to go through the process of, does this level sound good? Oh, I just saw the internet. 10 sounds okay. To me, I 10, mean, and, 10 and 15 has no difference to me. I that's like fine, but you're, you're bottlenecking yourself. Like, okay. you'll never get better that way. I, it's totally fine to think that way. But yeah, you're bottlenecking yourself, and you'll never get better. Like, someone who thinks that way will probably, and is at a particular level where they're better than somebody else who doesn't think that way, mm. that other person's going to catch up and exceed you very, very fast. And he's also going to develop, not just develop um, a better skill set than you, but develop a more unique footprint right. on his sound because he's discovering stuff for himself. He's formulating and testing his own opinions. And sometimes, sometimes your opinion will line up with someone else. Maybe someone will say, oh, and on this particular music source, I prefer to have this type of distortion. Mm. And you can experiment with it yourself and others and then you'll be like hey i kind of did like that one the best okay. and therefore that is still that becomes your own opinion now because you're not doing it because he said so you're doing it because you have tried it and you've tried others but yeah. you like that one the best that so becomes your own opinion it's uh, for you it's about experimenting always and never okay. never never settling with being safe um as a bit of a as a bit of a a detour of it one of the things that i um one of the things that I always preach to people is always mix with your, mix with your ears and not your eyes. And that seems okay. kind of like, oh, yeah, yeah. duh, kind of thing. But <laughs> when, we, when we see something on a screen, screens are great. I love screens. Yeah. Screens for days. But the reason why the screen is a detrimental thing is because sometimes we'll make a move on the screen. Like, I don't know if you've seen an EQ chart or like an EQ uh, okay. plugin. But like, if you, if you create a certain movement or a certain boost or cut in an EQ, it looks really weird. And you're okay. like, oh, I don't know about that. And like that, that means that's like really that, high, or that's re- yeah, that's like yeah, really yeah. high. Or that looks really odd. I've never seen that yeah, in yeah. anyone else's like stuff. I mean, why would that matter? If it sounds good to you, keep it. You know, like, but that's what I mean by like mix with your eyes, not, or mix with your ears, not with your eyes, because your eyes will deceive yeah. you. Your eyes will deceive you into thinking that something doesn't look right, mm. and it's taking away from your ears. If you close your eyes and do a similar move, you'll probably end up with something weirder. But because you closed your eyes and you trusted your ears, it sounds good. Yeah, even though it looks god awful. I think um, yeah, yeah. I think you've mentioned to me before that you do this thing where you close your eyes mm-hmm. when, so when you test I, out things. Yeah. yeah. So every time I boost or edit something, so every time I I find a frequency that I like, um, or a particular edit that I want to make, a, a cut or a boost, I close my eyes and I use a scroll wheel on my mouse to increase the value or decrease the value. And when I feel like it sounds right, I take I, I open up my eyes. And eight times out of ten. The control ends up in a in a position where I would never mm. have been in if I had my eyes open. Right, like it right, is in right. some sort of it's either too little or it's in some sort of other postal code of high. <laughs> but it it sounds great to me. And that's what to me that's that's what's most important. And one of the reasons why the digital age, in terms of music production specifically, um, has created a few more harsher roads to navigate. Because before they didn't really have screens, they just had knobs. Yeah, on yeah, the yeah. console. Sometimes people, like engineers that I knew who worked on those big SSL consoles or those big API ones, they don't even know what the values on the controls are. They'll literally just turn it until, right, it's like right. sounds, until it sounds good. And that's how they train their ears. And that's why they're so incredibly meticulous when it comes to hearing out particular things because they don't rely on a visual guide. Hmm. I think that's a, great, that's a great point, even in other areas of art. Mm. I mean, okay, with your, with... Visual art, don't close your eyes. Or, don't close don't your eyes. Yeah, do I don't know. Close, close your eyes if that's what you want to do. Fine. But, <laughs> that's a good um, point. That's a good point. No, no, I think that's a great point that you have when it comes to doing the work. You mm-hmm. don't have to do it just based on logic or based on what's taught. Sure, Actually. there's some wisdom and knowledge you can get from that. Fine. You know, that's part of it. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it's not just about sticking to what you've learned in that classroom or from that one person. Right? It's also about finding your own little style. For example, let's say in visual arts, maybe they'll teach you that these colors go together. Use these colors only. Mm-hmm. But then you... So sure, when you start out, you go through those colors, you realize, oh, they do look good together. And yeah. then maybe later on in life, you start venturing into different schemes, different ways of presenting 
the image that you have or let's say photography they teach you that it has to be um either symmetrical or, or rule of thirds like what if you're trying to do something different i feel like that's a great point that you have when it comes to sometimes you have to just do it until you want you like it i i, exactly. I feel like that's something that it doesn't have to follow the template of what the world gives you sure learn from that you know at the start fine see how it is see how it sounds see what the world expects from you but i don't think you should stay there for too long yeah like stop being scared yeah. get out there like don't be afraid to put yourself out and do something a bit different no one prince was not famous because he was trying to be somebody else prince was famous because he was prince yeah like just try and figure out your own thing and that will always get you further than and it'll be more fun to be honest it'll be more fun than just being built by or being contained by too many barriers i agree it's something that even for the podcast you know even for my work it it has to be done in a, in your own way sure mm-hmm. you learn at the start you copy from others that's part of mm-hmm. the journey mm-hmm. and then eventually you go beyond copying and do your own thing <laughs> whether well, it's well, mastering yeah. mixing um there's just a lot there do you have any other tips for people in that field or people who just want to get better with music in general uh well with music in general so with learning online and we had a we had a bit a bit of talk about this before as well and i hope you don't mind me grabbing good old strat here ahead. to make some musical based examples all uh, right so now you have your guitar in hand yeah heck yeah go for it Ooh. so um <laughs> When learning music for so this is particularly for people. I mean, I can use the guitar as an example, but this applies to everybody in any sort of field. When learning stuff digitally, the thing that the internet lacks most is not resources. Obviously, it's structure. Um, one of the things I agree with Enamori the most about in your previous podcast with her is that she advised getting a mentor. Mm. Um, whether you go to school or not. You should always have a mentor. It doesn't even have to be like a, a person who considers himself a leader. It's someone you respect and someone you can go to to ask questions right. and to guide you along the way. Yeah. And I 100% agree with that because the internet is so unstructured that honestly you need someone or something or you need to train yourself to navigate that information in a structured, in a structured way. I like to think learning on the internet as sort of like a puzzle. Okay. And for those of you who do puzzles, I don't know. If, I, I'm pretty sure this is correct, but <laughs> I'm pretty sure there's going to be like some, some nerdy kid who does like puzzles for like a living. Who's got like 50,000 piece puzzles. He's just sitting in a corner like, actually, the way you build a puzzle is that <laughs> you turn it towards the sun at like a 50 degree angle so that you can see the shadow of the missing pieces or something like that. Um, but the way you, I found effective to build a puzzle is you start with groups of pieces. So you either start on the edges, which is a, a popular what, what strategy as well. Yeah. Yeah. So you start at the edges where you can connect things and then you build inward or yeah. you start with groups of recognizable things like text. So you put yeah, all the yeah, text yeah. together and you start to build, but you build in, in parts where you start with a piece and then you start developing that piece and building mm. it out. You don't just put one piece from the box at a time and just hope everything kind of sticks. And I feel like that's the danger with learning online is that when you learn online, there's so much information and there's so much ways to get it that yeah. we end up not having a proper structure as to how we should navigate. Like if someone wants to learn guitar, where do you start is one thing, but where do you go from there? Yeah. And so you should always navigate the internet and use the knowledge there and build your own knowledge set, kind of like a puzzle. So for example, um, I, usually, I, use, I split my learning, my education, whether it's guitar, whether it's anything into two categories. Um, this is something I coined myself. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's implemented in another way, shape, or form. But it's educated, ed- educated study versus uh, impulsive study. Mm. So educated study is the idea of studying and learning fundamentals, theories, or techniques within a certain field or subject or genre right, that you want right, to cover right, from. Right. So more for your own education, like bettering yourself. Yeah. And so, for example, um, let's say somebody picks up a guitar and says, okay, I'm going to learn the G chord today. Yeah. All right. So besides that guitar being slightly out of tune, which I'm going to just double check right <laughs> now. Um, G string just never stays in tune. Any guitarist can oblige with that. So learn a G chord. Now, most people will stop at that. Like most yeah. people will stop at that. They might. And then if they venture forward, they'll do like the, the G power chord. So, yeah. so they'll yeah, do like yeah, power yeah. chords and stuff. 
And then if you venture further, people will do like, I don't know, seventh chords. Very like neo soul mm, kind of stuff. Yeah. And usually, I found that in the majority of guitar players, usually that's where you stop. Usually that is kind of where. That's where you, I stop. I'll be honest. Yeah. So that, yeah. <laughs> that's where the majority <laughs> do stop. Um, I learned the G7. I'm like, I'm good. Exactly. And it's a great chord. It's a great yeah. chord. I'm not bashing the chords or anything. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. There's something about that what, that tells me, like, you don't really understand a... You can play a G chord, but I guess you don't really understand the G chord as yeah. much as you could. Like, there's so many sources online to learn more about that G chord. So, for example, build on that. Like, maybe after that, let's break down the chord a bit. So, like, let's play the G major triad. So, like, break down the chord into its first degree, its third degree, and its fifth degree. And then after that learn that triad all like learn that particular group of notes all over the neck and then yeah go all so over now, the neck now like you're that. just hitting the same three notes yeah but all in, in different, different places areas. yeah exactly so and then after that then you can get into like maybe like really weird chords if you wanted to but like let's like maybe you can go into your seven so like you can do your g7 you can do your g7 sharp fives you could do your G7 sharp nines. You could do your sauces. <laughs> you can do like a bunch of different, a, a bunch of different chords. For sure, and, um, for sure. But you, that, that's really studying it. That's what I, that's what's, what involves putting, getting a piece of the puzzle and then building, building on top of that particular piece. Um, and then the next thing, and then you also have to be patient with yourself in that regard. Oh my gosh, as yeah. Well. Like don't, don't jump to, don't jump to particular topics like that. That stuff, like especially the triad stuff, didn't take me a day to memorize. I had to, I had to go back to it the next day, and I've forgotten like a lot of it. Oh, and for sure. So I'd have to, for I'd sure. have to grind it again, and then yeah. the next day I forgot like a third of it. So yeah. then I'll grind it out again. So take your time with it. Like we take a look at people online, and you you take a look at somebody like a designer, and you'd be like, oh my god, I'd love to replicate a piece like that, yeah. like a dress or something. But can you imagine how many years it took the designer just to perfect the contours? Oh, for sure. Or to, just to perfect his sense of contours. Just that. For and sure. Then how many years it took for him to prevent, him or her, sorry, to, um, yeah. to figure out what textures work. Mm. Like, you can't just replicate that immediately. You have to take one yeah. thing at a time, and you have to study it extensively yeah. and pace yourself out. And then the next sort of studying that I want to talk about is impulsive study. And impulsive study okay. is just studying whatever, whatever you want. So the first one's educational study? Yeah, educated study. Educated study. And then mm -hmm. now, which is structured yeah. and based on fundamentals and increasing your knowledge. For sure. And impulsive okay. study is taking a look at John Mayer's Instagram story and being like, <laughs> and he played something. And you'd be like, I want to learn that. That's yeah. totally, you do that. That's totally fine. Um, but when you learn something, you have to be able to implement it in your own stuff as well. Don't just learn something for the sake of learning something because otherwise you're just ripping off John Mayer. So, okay. for example, um, in that particular concert, when uh, in that Where the Light Is album, John Mayer plays Gravity. Now, I'm, I'm not John Mayer, but for one thing that John Mayer does really well in that, in that particular uh, song that I found is that he bends half a step after an original bend. So, for example, it would sound something like this. So he okay. does this. Um, he does that kind okay. of bend. Right, and right. that, I don't have to play that particular phrase, but I use that a lot in my own playing. So... Like that, that kind of bending, um, I stole from John Mayer, but I use it as well in my, in my old playing. If you take mm. a look at the uh, song by Mark Letiri called uh, Goon Squad, the intro roof goes like this. Okay. So it goes like that, and you could learn that, but if you don't do anything with that, you've just learned the intro to Goon Squad. Like, there's nothing, <laughs> special, about, there's nothing special about that. But what you can okay. do is pick it apart and just be like, well... That's a minor pentatonic, but yeah. instead of but he flattens the the fifth degree of the pentatonic scale instead of playing this because if it was a regular pentatonic it would sound like this. But he flattens the fifth, so that note, and then you realize well I can I can play that note in other places too I can play it here I can play it here yeah so then now when I play minor pentatonics yeah. It's funny that you mentioned that because I don't consider myself a musician, but I know how to play some instruments. Mm -hmm. um, I totally get that. The uh, Growing up, me, my dad called me the intro boy because I literally <laughs> learned the intro to a song 
And like I'd play that intro again and again and again, and then just the chords for the rest of the song. But mm-hmm. for the intro, I'd like sweat that out. I'd be like, I love this intro. I'm gonna learn <laughs> every detail of it. But then yeah, like what you said, it never got um, it never got you expanded on expanded on to yeah. uh, yeah. And this depends on your level of play. Like, obviously, if you're doing this casually, learn as many songs as you want. You don't have to take it any <laughs> deeper if you wanted to. But for the people who yeah, really yeah, yeah. want to invest in their craft, whether it's guitar, whether it's design, whether it's art, like, when you study other people, learn to rip them off. You know what I mean? Um, learn how to rip them off in your own, right. in your own playing after you've learned it. Otherwise, you're just playing Mark Letary stuff. You're just playing yeah, John yeah. Mayer stuff. Like, you're not playing your own, your own kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's educated study and impulsive study. I really like the difference that you had there. I feel like what you were mentioning about the second one, which is impulsive, which is where I fell into because I was more of that casual mm-hmm. learner, you know? Like I wanted to learn similar to you, I guess, you know? It was more like, you know, to jam with people because um, my family was into music and I, I like playing it also but it wasn't really like my love love like I didn't go right like, yeah I didn't go like I'm gonna be the best bass player ever like that, mm-hmm. that was never a thought that entered my mind um, but then that's the main difference between somebody like me and somebody like you I'd say that that's that's fair um, if you're willing to go through that those fundamentals if you're willing to go through that learning style where you you won't like what you're learning all the time, mm-hmm. but there will be it will pay off eventually. You know, um, you're not gonna use every single thing, but at least if you're trying to if you have something in your head, this is what I imagine, right? Because the the reason for me why it's been hard for me to make something out of, like let's say I imagine like a riff in my head and I can't play mm-hmm. it, um, on, if I have a guitar I can't play it right away or I can't play it even if you give me like an R it'll be difficult for me. It's because of stuff like that. I didn't have that kind of fund- fundamental learning, which I think you really need if you want to be great at it. And it's not just about music, right? It can be... Uh, I think you mentioned this earlier. Like, For example, for me, I, I used to do a lot of Photoshop work. You know? I used, mm-hmm. to do, I used to do that kind of creative stuff. Now, if someone asks me, hey, can you make a poster? I can make a poster for you in five minutes or less, right? But that yeah. was like two or three years of making bad posters and it's just Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's just part of it yeah it's always part of it and it's frustrating sometimes of course like i'm not going to be the one to preach that you know sitting down for an hour playing augmented scales for like an hour a day is fun it really isn't and they're not the greatest sounding scales when you play them by themselves as well but if an opportunity presents itself where you could implement an augmented scale then suddenly you know how to do it yeah. Um, and you could also like, one of the best things about doing stuff like that is that you can, you, you add a new dimension to your songwriting. Mm. So for example, you, let's say that you want to do something based on the notes E and A. So if you're doing like a, that's boring, yeah. right? But if you knew your triads, you could do something like this. That sounds interesting, and that is floods mm. by Snarky Poppy. So okay. that already itself sounds more interesting than just just going over for sure. E and A, adding those. That's the first ones what I play. I'm just kidding. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, so get, get go deeper into your learning. Really yeah, push yeah, yeah. the boundaries and discover stuff yeah. for yourself. I I have a question for you mm-hmm. actually. Um, what if there's somebody out there, right? Um, let's say this person wants to do funk. He knows he wants to do funk. Mm-hmm. Does he have to go through metal? Does he have to go through pop? Does he have to go through all of that? He or she, sorry. Does he, he or she have to go through all of this? Just if, he, But he really, really wants to go funk. What are your thoughts on that? Mm, yeah, yes and no. So the reason I say that is that no, you don't necessarily have to like understand your... You don't have to understand your blues licks mm. uh, in order to get funky, although there's a lot of blues playing that does have happen in funk. Mm. But what ends up happening is that a lot of the influences that you would listen to as like a funk player, uh, you'd grab it from blues players. Um, mm. Those people who play funk, they grab a lot of their inspiration from blues players, from jazz players, from Afro-Cuban 
rhythms. Like they grab their stuff from a lot of different things. So if you were to focus hypothetically on solely one artist, you would understand that he actually gets a lot of stuff from people who aren't playing, who aren't playing funk mm, as yeah. well. Um, and so in that, in that same respect, as long if you want to be a metal player, you don't necessarily have to study blues, but you have to have a funda- unde- fundamental st- understanding of the tools that blues players use. Mm. So you don't have to know, know your, your, like, your bluesy licks or anything like that. Mm. Like, yeah. You don't have to understand how to do that kind of stuff, but you do mm. have to understand what that is. That's, a, that's an A minor pentatonic. You have to understand <laughs> that because yeah. if you understand okay. that and you know how to play that, then you can create metal licks around that. Um, so fundamentals are always going to be important. And I mm. think that if you were to focus, hyper-focus on one genre, which I don't think is a good idea anyway, but if you were to hyper-focus on one genre, then you should at least learn the fundamentals of, yeah. of music in general. If someone wants to get better, for example, right? Suddenly I, I wake up tomorrow morning and I'm like, you know what? I'm quitting podcasting. I'm going to be a guitarist, you know? Mm-hmm. I'm going to be the best. What would you tell me? Would you tell me to focus on one thing or diversify what I'm learning? Uh, so when, when I usually find a lot of people who get interested in guitar, like it would depend on what made you interested. So okay. let's say that you, someone wants to play guitar because they saw, uh, I, don't, I don't know, Sonny Landreth playing in a concert and he wants to learn guitar. Mm. So Sonny Landreth is a blues player. Uh, he's a slide player. So besides all the regular things like, picking up a guitar, mm. learning how to press your finger down into the fret, like all those fundamentals, yeah. you should immediately gravitate to what Sonny Landreth kind of does. Like, for example, Sonny, you want to understand the blues scale. You want to maybe experiment with some sliding because Sonny Landreth plays with a metal slide. Um, you want to experiment with that kind of stuff simply because when you're young, or not when you're young, but when you're starting out an instrument, a lot of it's passion-driven. Yeah, um, sure. And you don't know whether later on you want to invest in it or not, but you mm. know that you want to play because of this particular person. Yeah. So it would be in your best interest and the fastest way for you to develop and um, sort of invest in your interest if, of course, you could play the stuff that the person who inspired you to play plays. Right. So um, when I first started playing guitar, I would literally just vomit out slash licks. Yeah, for sure. Every single day because that's the guy that inspired me. Um, not to the not to the um, graceful acceptance of my parents who had to listen to a really <laughs> botched version of <laughs> who had to listen to that for like six months on end. I didn't actually learn the rest of the song. I just learned that. Same. That hey, you're part. an so, intro boy. Welcome in. Yeah, exactly. I'm into the club, dude. That's exclusive prim- <laughs> VIP stuff. So um, obviously, like, learn the stuff that makes you that yeah. gets you hyped about guitar. There's nothing yeah. wrong with that. Um, and then later on, depending on how much you want to apply yourself in guitar, then you can start dabbling in everything else. But, um, I would always recommend somebody and in any field, um, let's say you were a, uh, uh, I don't know, give me something here. Yeah. Like a voice actor or something. And you wanted to invest in your craft and you got inspired by people who voice acted for Korean animation. (laughs) Then when you are practicing, and when you're developing your lines, and when you're developing your thought flow, and you're developing your expressiveness, why not try and model it after somebody who you looked up to For in sure. the Korean voice acting sure. scene? Like, why not try and almost rip off somebody? Yeah. And then try to develop yourself, develop yourself from there. That's um, that's, that's yeah. Yeah, that's the best way to keep inspired early on, especially because early on is the hardest part. Oh, for sure. Um, that's uh, even in this podcast, I've had my. I've had like the specific two, three podcasts that I, I made this after. You know what I mean? I, I, I looked at their stuff and I'm like, I like what they're doing. Mm-hmm. I saw the way that they lay out things. I saw the way that how mm-hmm. they talk. Yeah. You know, I got a little bit from each different podcast and then you make it my own. I, I think that's what you mean, if I'm not mistaken. Y- yeah, right? no, you, absolutely. You, you copy as much as you yeah. can. You learn as much as you can. And then along the way, you evolve that because really nothing is truly original. No, not you know? at all. I don't believe in originality yeah. at all. I believe in hiding originality really well. <laughs> I believe that you could, I believe everybody's a ripoff, but other people, like really good musicians know how to rip off. They, they can rip off people. really well. Yeah, they can rip yeah. off really, really well yeah. to the point where it sounds original. And as long yeah. as it sounds original, you're good. It doesn't have to be. But what it are your original. thoughts on guitarists, in, like specifically that, 
because here's the thing. I grew up in Europe. Of course, we were in high school. The, the coolest thing you could do as a guitar player is shred that guitar. Mm-hmm. The faster you played, the better. Mm-hmm. The, the more notes per second, the more people were like, wow, this guy's good. What are your thoughts on that? Well, if he can actually play it accurately, then he probably is really good. Okay. Right? Like, I, I am not going to be a person to bash people who play that way because I can't do it for my life. Okay. I used to be a metalhead, and I used to actually be pretty fast, I would say so myself, but I, I don't... These hands have, like, grown, like, um, walking sticks, <laughs> and they are on, they're living on pension right now. They're on a pension fund, so these things are At least they have a pension and, fund. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> so these things, these things are insured, and they're not as um, sporadic as they once mm. was, uh, and obviously my interests don't align with that anymore, yeah. but... There's a lot of really, really fast players that I, I respect a lot. Jason Richardson obviously being a very, very popular choice. Uh, Rick Graham is unreal. Tom Quayle. Uh, who else am I looking at here? There's a, but actually, a lot, a lot of jazz cats are really fast okay. as well. And they're very accurate. And to be honest, like at the end of the day, another person's opinion on your playing is second to the opinion of your own playing. So... Mm. The fast stuff I could appreciate, and I understand why people appreciate that because it's flashy, right? Yeah. But for me, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to force myself to play it. One, because I, again, these fingers don't move as they used to. Yeah. But also, it's not what I enjoy. Like mm. I would, if I spent hours and hours a day trying to figure out like my sweep picking, which I obviously cannot do, <laughs> um, then it would just be a waste of my time because I'd end mm. up at the end of the road being able to sweep pick, yeah. but not really enjoying it. Mm. You know, so to those guitar, to answer your question, to those guitarists, I say, if you love it, keep doing it because it's awesome and I can't do it. (laughs) That's okay. But for anyone, but for anyone else who is envying them, ask yourself, is that really what you want to do? If it is, then definitely study up because you can be as good as that. If it's not, then focus on something else. Yeah. I will always be a big avid listener of metal, but I never practice metal in my spare time. Okay, fair. Like I love, I love really, I love heavier bands like Car Bomb or yeah. Within Destruction. Yeah, bands like that. Super, super on the heavy side of the spectrum, but I never invest time in learning their songs sure. or learning what they do yeah. because it's just not what I like to play. But I love listening to it. Last few questions, um, before we go into the speed round. So oh, there's a speed. Okay. Yes, sir. What is your biggest pet peeve that you see in rising musicians or audio engineers oh okay so let's say that you um for example are a um a swimmer and you are you consider yourself pretty good Okay. Right. You consider yourself I'm a pretty good. I'm yeah. great at what and I do. And you're great. Yeah, yeah, you're great. You're you're better than even not maybe just not even better than your friends, but like so probably one of the top. I'm amazing country. at it. Yeah, I you're, have amazing. A you're amazing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so let's say that you get into a you walk into a bar and okay. you find a you find Michael Phelps there. I don't Ooh. know a lot of Olympic swimmers, but let's I don't just know. I just know Michael Phelps. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> Michael right, Phelps, right. right? Michael Phelps is there and you sit down and have a chat. How much a percentage of the chat do you think should be Michael Phelps and should be you in regards to swimming? 90% him. Exactly. And why is that? Because even if you understand that you're really, really good, you, I mean, it'd be, it'd be almost blasphemous not to listen to what Michael Phelps has to say in terms of technique, in terms of practice and stuff like that. Like you become, even if you were maybe to your friends, like a teacher of swimming Mm. at some point, you instantly without, a dent in your ego or without any assumptions whatsoever, you instantly become a listener True. because there is something about Michael Phelps, like 90 gold medals. Yeah. That says that he's better than you. Yeah. There's something about that. I think I'll just use the 10% to describe myself and see what I can improve upon that. Exactly. Which is still focusing on his word, like his mm -hmm. ideas. Yeah. Go on. And so one to elaborate on that, one of the biggest pet peeves I see in younger musicians, younger engineers, younger graphics designers, younger anyone, is that they have a very odd gauge of their own skill in terms of when they when they can be the preacher and mm. when they need to listen. So, okay. for example, there's a lot of people that I know that come to me for engineering advice or guitar advice, right. and I'll happily give it to them. But 
if I were to get into a conversation with like Emil de Rosa, for mm. example, I would not speak at all. I'd shut yeah, the hell yeah. up and I would just listen to what that man exudes <laughs> and just sponge it, sponge it all up, you know? Yeah. Like, and I would have no problem with that. If Emil tells me that I'm doing something wrong or that he feels like something like this should be, can be done better, yeah. I will at the very least attempt it and mm. find out for myself without a question because I understand that he is a better engineer than I am. Okay. So that's the kind of that's the kind of mentality and attitude that I feel like needs to be preached a lot in our okay. particular generation, especially artists. Artists are the worst at this when it comes to like their <laughs> ego and when it comes to gauging their own skill set. Like learn how to listen. Um, mm. If I were to get put in a jam with Ariel Posen, I almost would not play. I would just oh, sit there and just yeah, like yeah. listen to him. Obviously, I'm not playing after Ariel Posen plays, but <laughs> like, yeah, like just learn learning when to listen. Mm. And learning when to put everything that you know aside and into into question, yeah, um, in front of someone more experienced than you, yeah, is a super important skill set to have. And I feel like not a lot of people, when they start out, have it. That's a great point. I feel like mm. most people in the creatives are feel that way. I mm-hmm. can't speak for people who are not in the creatives because I'm not really in that field, right? But I do understand that feeling. Like, at a certain once you have one project out there, suddenly you're like, yeah, I'm, I'll give you advice, you know? Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Suddenly <laughs> you're like the Gandhi of whatever the heck you just did. Like, I'll give you a personal example. Um, it was funny because you mentioned to me before that you mentioned that like, oh, I'm, I'm the podcast guy. Like, I remember you saying that to me. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. in my head, I'm like, no, I've done seven episodes at, at that point. And I'm like, no way. Like, I've only done seven episodes. And... It's a part of learning that you have to, number one, be humble and learn from the people mm-hmm. before you. Mm-hmm. Um, at the same time, at one point, you become a teacher. At what point do you think we can become teachers? Hmm. So, if anyone... Okay, so if, if anyone... Normally, the best way to give advice is only for people who ask for it. Um, Fair, yeah. Don't don't just uh, like exude yourself onto somebody. Don't just impose <laughs> your your mighty massive cranium hey, onto I've done somebody. Seven episodes, like, yeah, you know, uh, exactly. Don't don't shove me. your cranium <laughs> cranium down someone's throat if they didn't ask for it. So obviously, no matter what skill level you are, if someone asks you for your opinion, mm. you should give it. Um, when we become teachers, should never. I, I to be honest, the certain point of when we become a teacher really just narrows it down to that when people start asking you. Yeah. for advice but the point at which we become teachers should never overwhelm the point at which we become learners or like students or listeners mm, because yeah, yeah. like you said at the beginning there is some asian kid in taiwan <laughs> who is like six years old and can play at like fifty thousand bpm upside down blindfolded mm. in a tub of vaseline yeah, right yeah, yeah like he will outskill you 10 to 1 and mm. if he has something to say about his practice routine there is no way in hell that i'm going to be like oh well i mean i'm older than you i'm more experienced <laughs> than you like i know i'm more mature. how many There's battle no po- how many battle of the bands have you been to kids? yeah how many battles have you you haven't even touched high school like there's i haven't <laughs> like i would never ever say that i would yeah, shut yeah. up and i would listen so um at what point we become teachers is yeah like when somebody asks us for advice obviously but we should always actively go towards being a listener first all okay. the time. Okay. All the time. Yeah. In what would you want to say to the aspiring musicians and audio engineers out there, anyone who's doing a certain craft? But for you specifically in music, in specifically in audio, um, to the person who's struggling in it, to the person who's thinking about it, what would the word what would you want to say to those kind of people who are thinking? I wanna get into it, but I'm not sure if I can. Or I'm not sure if I'm good enough for it. What what would your words of advice be? Uh, you'll never find out if you're not good enough until you try it. Mm-hmm. Like that's a it's a it's a weird thought to have in the beginning. We're like, oh, what if I'm like not good enough at it? What how if I the suck? Hell would, yeah. How the hell would you know if yeah. you haven't even tried it? So go out there and try, go out there and try it. If you fail, you fail. Yeah. Like we we are so afraid of failure because of this whole like instantaneous media generation mm. where like we only see successes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Online. And I'm not saying you shouldn't post your failures online. You should always post your successes. But like, <laughs> don't get in. Don't get in the. Don't get in the idea that like, the 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 piece of music or the the the, the playing of somebody you found online wasn't done in like the ninth take or something <laughs> like that. Like, 
you people make <laughs> mistakes. Like it is fine. There's nothing yeah, wrong yeah. with making a mistake. When you you truly fail when you just give up. Like um, yeah. failing isn't making a mistake. Failing is just giving up. Like yeah. failing is just saying like no, nope, that's it. Throwing yeah. in the towel. That that is when you can say you failed at a task. If you released a piece of music and it wasn't up to your particular standard, that's not failing. That's mm. like okay, that wasn't necessarily what I wanted. We go again. We'll mm. take but take that it. We'll take that for what it is. We'll learn from it and then we'll go from then. That's not yeah. failure to me. Mm. Failure is just saying like oh my god that sucks. I can't do this anymore. <laughs> and then that you failed at it. Which again, if it's not for you. It's not for you, but if yeah. you get fail, if you if you feel that way about like one release, then it probably isn't for you at all. Yeah. Um, to be quite honest, uh, music is more of a calling than mm. it is a career. Yeah. Um, any doubt that you feel, um, as to whether that is your calling or not, is probably a sign that it isn't. Um, not to say that you doubt you like doubting yourself in terms of your skill set and doubting yourself whether this is the career you want or not is two different things. Mm. And a lot of people do doubt their choice of whether like whether they want to pursue music or not mm. and depending on where that doubt comes from it's probably a, a sign that it isn't really for mm. you because music is more of a calling than it is a career yeah. and you have to be able to accept that and you have to be able to move forward with it and you have to genuinely enjoy mm. what you're what you're doing like you have to wake up every morning like if you want to get anywhere with music i'm talking to yeah, people yeah, who yeah. want to like take this very very seriously yes, you yes, have yes, to yes. wake up you have to wake up every morning with the idea that like, oh my God, I'm so excited to practice or, mm. oh my God, today I'm going to learn this or, oh my God, I'm going to work on this today. Yeah. Obviously it doesn't have to be every day because you do need your rest, mm. of course, and it can get very overwhelming. But if that isn't the majority of your days, then you're not getting far very, very fast. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like if yeah. that's not the majority of your days, you're unfortunately not getting very far, very fast. So yeah. especially now, and I'm not saying that we, I mean, we, we, we should take this COVID um, whole season very, very seriously. Um, make sure to be safe and to make sure that, you know, we, we follow uh, sanitation laws accordingly. But yeah. if, and, and, and COVID is a horrible thing, but if we take this time to sort of, now that we're kind of to ourselves, if we do have any time to really hone in on our weaknesses and to focus on ourselves if, as musicians, as designers, as um, upcoming actors, as yeah. upcoming anything, this is, or movie editors, this is the time to do it. This would be probably one of the better times to do it, where you have the flexibility of maybe monitoring your schedule with mm. a bit more ease. Yeah, I agree. One thing I would say is that your first run is probably going to be really bad. Let, let's oh, yeah. be honest. Guaranteed, guaranteed. 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 Your first, anything you release, whether it's a poster, my personal experience, a poster... <laughs> My first podcast was listen to my voice. I'm so shaky. It's just yeah, a part of it, you know. And you you have to go into this kind of stuff knowing that the first ones you'll do will probably be horrible. Like <laughs> yeah. you'll yeah. have to you when you want to get into podcasting, for example, you have to be secure with the fact that your first podcast is probably 99.5% of the time going to be horrible and not make anything. It's funny cuz yeah. What it will do is make you a better podcaster. Yeah, it's funny because during the time with my very first podcast, which is not this one, but the first episode of mm. Bente, Don and I, that was our first podcast ever. And we just did it, you know? We were like, mm. hey, let's just do it. Um, and look where we are now. We we hit, hit we hit more than seven episodes. So that's great. Apparently, seven episodes is the average per podcast. Apparently, that's a thing. Um, well, congratulations on that. Thank that's you. Huge. And and not and not just that, but you've also like you've nailed the process. You're not yeah. shaky in your vocals anymore. You yeah. understand what needs to get set up on your system. Yeah. You understand the the potential problems with recording other people yeah. can can incur, and then you prepare accordingly. Like you you've done all of this, mis- all of these mistakes for sure in order to mistake for sure. yourself for sure. And it's a part of the process if you want to get mm-hmm. better. Um, mm-hmm. And I think with you, what you were saying is really interesting too, because. When it comes to music, what you said was very accurate. It's very passion driven at the start. Yeah. It's very um, I love music. It makes me feel something. You know, it's very it, that's the main drive most of the time. Mm-hmm. Or it's not. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna get money from this. Like it, it's it's very it, difficult to reach that. Here's point. my public service announcement. Anyone in the music industry who's in it for the money, you are in the wrong place. <laughs> like this is that is like the most unintelligible move you've ever made in your life if you're doing music for the money i mean yeah. obviously you need to be able to financially support obviously, yourself if that yeah, is yeah. your calling but if your initial draw to it was the fame and the money i'm sorry you're in the wrong place man 
I don't think a money, someone who loves money, sure, they can go into business. They'll be like, hey, I want to be rich. Right? Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll start a business. I'll learn from people. I don't think anyone has ever been like, I want to have a lot of money. Let me think of music. You'd be very surprised. You'd be very surprised. <laughs> You'd be very, very surprised. But yeah, that, this is not, not the right mindset. It's very passion driven. It's mm. more, like I said, it's more of a calling yeah. than it is a career. Mm. Um, and you have to be ready to throw yourself into the deep end. And you have to be ready, like we talked about for a couple of minutes now, you have to just be ready to be garbage. Like just don't be afraid to be absolute trash. Yes, sir. It goes with anything. Like I'm garbage at val- I'm garbage yeah, at Valorant. Yeah. Like you I was will, so bad at Valorant, but you will get better, I think. Yeah, you will be really bad, but that's part of it. You just have to be willing to get better. Yeah, yeah exactly. Taking the right steps to get better and not being put down yeah. by mistakes. All right. Anything else? Any last words before we take a break? Um. No. Hmm, let's see. Uh. No. I think we'll go, we'll go straight for the break, and then we'll right. see what happens after that. All right, let's go take a quick break. All right, we're back from the break. I'm still with Nick. Still with it's Nick. Lightning time. It's lightning time. It's buddy. lightning time. All right. You know, in, in lower school, I had the 100-meter track record. Wait, so, what's lower school? Oh, I don't know, like second grade? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know. I, had the, I had the 100-meter track record, so I'm ready for this lightning round, dude. I'm so fast. All right, so you're going to have a few questions similar to previous podcasts, but okay. a bit different as well. All right, so Nick, for you, mm-hmm. what was the hardest song that you've ever had to mix or master? <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Oh, no. Okay, that's an easy one. Sorry. Rumors by Nathan and Rick. Okay. And the reason Why? being is because Rumors was... Um, so Alex told me about getting me to mix rumors. And yeah. so this was like uh, way, way, way back. And I was like, okay, sure, no problem. And yeah. I could expect it by this time. Mm. Great. So this time passed and it was a couple of weeks later and I was like, oh, I'm still not getting anything. They must've just caught up in the production process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, I had a cruise planned, an Alaskan yeah. cruise planned for that particular day. Oh, and the day before, the, yeah, so yeah. the day before the Alaskan cruise, Alex goes, okay, here's the files. By the way, they have a due date. They need it in like two days. I'm like, I'm on a... <laughs> I'm on a boat. And then so what ended up happening that day is that not only, so that night, the night before the cruise, I had to transfer all of my software onto my laptop because all of my software is on a main computer, a desktop computer. So I had to transfer everything onto the laptop and then, and then test it to see if it works, which obviously it doesn't the first time. So then you have to retransfer and like figure out your licensing and stuff for your plugins. Oh, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Your licensing for your plugins. And then after that, I had to actually, I didn't really sleep that night because I had to listen to it. I had to listen. I've never, I've never listened to the track. So I had to listen to it. And to my dismay, they had like 50 million percussion tracks all named like yes. Carlo Breath 1, <laughs> Carlo Yawn 2. Like, what the hell is they that? They had everything. Like, they had a paper tear. Yeah, they had everything. Yeah, they had everything. And they were named like Carlo Door Slam 1, Carlo Breath. <laughs> like, what the heck? Is, what's Carlo Breath? And so <laughs> I had to sort through all of those files and then take that with me on a boat, which is not the most ideal listening environment. For sure. I had decent headphones, but For like sure. that only gets you so far. Yeah. And so I mixed that out in the middle of the Alaskan Ocean. Um, no internet, by the way. When Sheesh. I submitted it to Alex, I was in a public library in like a small town on the coast of Alaska, with ha- which had like two personnel yeah. running it and like really bad Wi-Fi. So That's it took crazy. a while. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I mixed, that, I mixed that on a cruise. That was by far, no, not even close, the hardest mix I ever had to do. I'm glad it turned out okay-ish, I think. Yeah. I do have a lot of criticisms about it, but that's more on me. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, that is by far the hardest mix. Well, you know the Nathan and Mercury boys love you. I, I, and I love them too. <laughs> love them a bit. All right. Among all the songs that you've mixed or mastered, what song would you do again? If you could have a redo, what would you like to remix or remaster? Rumors. <laughs> I like to do rumors again, please. What a second one, dude. Oh my! I want to. I want to see what the. That's actually a genuine answer. I want to see what, how well I could, or how different it would sound if I didn't do it, with like surrounded by orcas and dolphins. You know. That's crazy. All right. Also, I get motion sick. I get motion sick really easily on boats, so that also didn't help. One random morning, you wake up, you check your emails, it says. There's a famous, or not even famous, but there's a Filipino band slash artist who wants to work with you. 
mm-hmm. open here to find out who it is. Who do you hope to find inside? Anna Mori. Absolutely. Oh. <laughs> Absolutely. Anna. Um, if it was, okay. So this is not, this is partially not biased because okay. the reason why I answered Anna Mori is because um, uh, I already, ha- I haven't worked with Anna Mori okay. before. Yep. If, if I haven't worked with anybody and I opened up something, I definitely would. There's a lot of options to choose from. I would definitely have like, if I never met the Nathan and Mercury boys, mm. that would definitely be an easy pick. Um, uh, I know that uh, I would I would like to work uh, with One Click Straight, and mm. to be co- quite honest, not really because of their music, because I, I, as good as their music is, it's not necessarily up my field. Okay. But they are very good at production. Like yeah, I would yeah, imagine I agree, that the files that they the files that they give me would be stellar. They would mm. be great soundscapes, great use of um, of different synthetic textures and stuff right. like that. And I really respect um, their ability to do that really well. So right. that would be a really fun production thing to take on um but i i'll, I'll go back to my old answer in amori because i feel like she is a very good she's a very unique very high potential pop artist and mm. i do like the direction that she's going with her music I especially agree. with the I team agree. that she has behind her mm. like i'm always a big fan of tim's stuff um yeah. and so anything that he touches turns to instant gold and and has been a favorite of mine since a while back. So, yeah, definitely yeah. Anna. So, suddenly, someone asks you, hey, we have five more slots for a music festival. Who are you picking? Who's your five? Ariel Posen, Sarky Puppy, Corey Wong, uh, Wolf Peck, and uh, John Schofield. There. Oh, that's a great set. Yeah, it's really fast. I know this one. That's a really, really fast set. That's a great um, set. It's not, it's not very diverse, but it's a great no, set. No, it's not. It's not that, this is, that, that is my set. That is my, that's my like, set. That's like what you want to hear, and that's yeah. yeah that's that's, that's, that's what, what I want to hear. As much as I love all types of music, yeah, there is no way one person can say that there's one particular genre that isn't their favorite, or there's one particular yeah. field that is not their favorite. And those guys encompass everything that I like in guitar playing, except for John Schofield. I like John Schofield because I want him to tell me how much I suck. Like I want him <laughs> to play it. I want him to play in front of me and make me feel so illiterate as a guitar player. Yeah. Yeah. That, that'd be my concert. All right. I'm going to give you a bunch of genres and subgenres. Mm-hmm. You tell me who's your favorite in that genre, subgenre as of right now. Okay. 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 Let me just juggle up my musical memory here. Go ahead. I mean, you can have a few seconds to think about it, but then as fast as you can. I think I... Okay, I'll see, I'll see you as fast as I can. Let's see. Let's go. All right. Hip-hop. Hip-hop? Uh, definitely right now, I'm listening to a lot of the older Roots band. Okay. The Roots are really old hip-hop. Th- th- that's um, a great place to be in right now. Yeah, The Roots, for sure. Country? Country? Um, anything Josh Smith touches, or if not, the Brothers Landreth. Mm, pop. Pop? Um, there's a band called Mr. Wives. Uh, electro electro pop, which I really mm. really enjoy. If not that, then Carly Rae Jepp. Ooh, Carly Rae is a great. I love Carly Rae. Punk. Punk. So I don't dabble too much in punk, mm. but from from recent viewings, I would definitely like to say like I've been getting a lot into the um, really the older punk stuff, like the Who. Okay. Um, uh, really old UK UK okay, pop okay, okay. would would do it for me for sure. Pop punk. Pop punk, uh, I'm a big fan of Four Years Strong. Uh, I've, okay. I've still been a big fan of Four Years Strong. Uh, and if not that, then the um, there's another band called... Uh, oh, it escapes my head now. Let's just stick with Four Years Strong because just the other <laughs> band escapes my head. Um, it's called them just General Rock. General Rock? Oh, there's a... Uh, there's a great... Me- if you're talking like... Are you talking heavy rock or is that a separate thing? Um, separate. Is metal a separate yeah, thing? Yeah. Okay. So for general rock, I definitely have to say Joey Landreth. So okay. Okay. he's part of the Brothers Landreth band. But mm. when he does his own solo stuff, he's more. it's more upbeat. It's more up-tempo. It's more energetic. So I would mm. consider that a bit different from the country rootsy right, feel right. of his of the Brothers Landreth band. So right. Joey Landreth for sure. Blues. Blues... Um, that's actually a really tricky one. So blues, I would definitely have to say, uh, 
Sonny Landreth, who is not. It, it sounds like he's related to Joey Landreth, but he's not. It's a completely <laughs> different person. Um, Sonny Landreth and Robert Ford, for sure. Very right. old school um, blues players. Mm. Um, Sonny Landreth being such a good slide player and Robin Ford just having this amazing guitar sound yeah. that I just want to like pick apart with a scalpel. Right. But yeah, definitely those two. Funk. Funk? Oh, fuck. Too many, too many. <laughs> um, Louis, Louis Cole, Corey Wong, Mark Letary. Ooh. For, for cur- currently, right now, yeah, um, yeah. Wolfpack. I mean, there's there's way too many. There's way too um, many. I'm I'm currently dabbling in Louis Cole yeah. right now. Who is like Louis Cole reminds me of Jacob Collier if he was less jazz, more funk, and did more shrooms. <laughs> uh, that's what Louis Cole reminds me of. Um. This is tricky. Let's, let's go a bit more. Um, to the subgenre section. Mm-hmm. That's really tricky. All right. Um, you because okay, just for the listeners, you said that you have almost for every single. You have a playlist for almost every single genre. General general genre. I don't get too super specific. Like I don't have a playlist for like sludge, death, Irish metal. <laughs> and that's like I was like I don't I don't get too specific. Right, right, right. Okay. Do you have anything for dream pop? Dream pop, oh, let me think about that. I do actually. Um, in my pop playlist, yeah, there's a couple of dream pop bands in there that I do like. Um, there is one group called uh, actually, don't know if it's dream pop, but there's this one group called uh, Paris. Paris. I love that movie. You do, you do. It's a good movie. Parasite. Par- <laughs> Parasite. Yeah, no, a great movie. I think it's Parasails or something like that. Okay, okay, okay. And they are there. They're. I, I believe it's Dream Pop. They people can correct me if I'm wrong. All right. But, um, definitely, the, definitely that one. Although Dream Pop is not a genre that I dabble in a lot as well. Yeah, that yeah, being yeah. said, so yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. All right, so we're gonna be going back to. Well, we're gonna have genres and subgenres. All right, so we're gonna go mm-hmm. now to heavy metal. Heavy metal, car bomb. There's a Brisbane Ooh. band called car bomb and i don't know if you've ever listened to their stuff i doubt you have but if you have they are mind like your your speakers just melt and it's mind-blowing like so much energy so like weird sounds coming out left and right it's so heavy it's so beautiful so yeah car bomb and that's a shout out to the australian music scene nice did i say jazz already i didn't huh no you did not jazz um john schofield right now for sure um if not john schofield then uh probably really old like Certain records of um, Paul Jackson Jr. Mm. and um, uh, Larry Carlton. I'm not sure. I've never asked you about this. Musical theater. Is there anything in that genre? Uh, so, here, okay, here's the thing about musical theater um, for myself. I, 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 I really admire a lot of the people in the music theater industry. And I think it's a very, very hard... Um, calling for to sure. take a part of for sure but i'm not the biggest fan of okay broadway so i don't have a favorite classical although the although the lemis soundtrack's kind of okay okay the Cla- Lemis, yeah. but that's music. a really basic that's like a really basic <laughs> that's like a really basic taste so. for sure they're yeah. basic there yeah you, you just mentioned like all artists that i'm not familiar with and then you go to, <laughs> <laughs> and, then you, and then you go to the I most have, basic theater. dude there are theater kids that are shutting off your podcast <laughs> right now just stop listening i'm so sorry um okay let's go back folk folk music um oh there's this there's this one i recently found um i love her uh her Mm. name is um her name is madison cunningham she is an australian american rootsy folk folk um singer and guitarist and she is incredible she's so musical so smooth it's got vibe definitely check her out madison cunningham for sure r&b R and B, uh, anything that has been touched by Isaiah Sharkey. Um, okay. Or if not that, then um, I mean, D'Angelico is a pretty uh, D'Angelo. Sorry, is a very common taste, and mm. I do understand why. He's a very very smooth person, and yeah. anything also touched by Kirk Franklin. Oh, okay, okay, fair. Soul. Soul. Definitely. Tower of Power. Actually, I love Tower. I love Tower of Power. Right? Soul is actually really tricky. Um, because the thing about Soul is that I like I like Soul music, but I like Soul music when it bleeds into other genres that isn't okay, Soul. Okay, fair, fair. So, anything that I any again anything that I will probably mention in other genres will probably be influenced by Soul in one way okay. or another. So I can't really say anything for Soul. Um, EDM. 
EDM. Um, earlier, I said Mr. Wives for pop. Okay, okay. Um, yeah. They're kind of in that electro spectrum, so right, right. Uh, for sure, I would put Mr. Wives back in there as well. But um, if you're talking more like electronic stuff, then maybe Grimes. I like okay. Grimes. I think okay. Grimes and Aura are really cool. All right. Last two. Mm-hmm. Um, gospel. Gospel, definitely. Ooh, uh, here, here, uh, gospel, 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 gospel. There's a, um, an artist, a female artist, uh, Erin Allen Kane. Erin? Oh, I, I love her. So I love her. Good. So good. So good. It's, it's not necessarily gospel, but it's very gospel inspired. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It moves I, I, as I, a gospel I, piece would. I and understand what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's such a great voice. Great All right. Voice, yeah. Oh, sorry. No, this starting now. It's the last two. <laughs> um. Wait. What was I gonna say again? You tell me. I was gonna say. Oh my gosh. Uh. Oh, do you have anything in the world genre? Okay. Um. So there is um one of the guitarists for Snarky Poppy, Chris McQueen, has mm-hmm. a Afro Cuban, um okay. band that he plays in. And he also does a, a, an extensive online course on Afro-Cuban music and how to incorporate that in, like, your own music. Mm. How to incorporate Afro-Cuban um, beats and, uh, and, and, and subdivisions like that. Mm. So definitely his band, uh, his Afro-Cuban band, for sure. I, I can't remember off the top of my head what it was called. But his particular Afro-Cuban project, really cool. All right. Um, <clears throat> last but not least, mm. Reggae. <laughs> you might have actually hit something that I don't actually listen to regularly. There you uh, go. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, I'll be honest. I'm not. Uh, I haven't listened to anything reggae in. Oh, okay. No. Um, one band that I really appreciate uh, in the reggae in the reggae spectrum is a uh, a group called Magic City Hippies. I've never. Heard and of them. they're not 100 percent reggae, but they're very very inspired. Okay. By reggae, and if you take a listen to them, it's it's super it's super dreamy. It's very feel good. Yeah. It moves in certain rhythms that you would attest to. Yeah. Uh, reggae music, but yeah, they have Magic City Hippies for sure. Do you Close have any get, genres in your head? Reggae. I've run out. Uh. I'm not counting house or the more electronic i count that in the electronic part for now you can do like you can do well that's like indie like oh fine indie, all right yeah the indie, indie genre the um, indie genre the, there's a lot as well in that regard the the griswolds group love japanese breakfast Ooh. um siamese yeah. uh there's a, the decemberist yeah there's a lot in that genre i, I oh, dabble in a lot of indian that they, they kind of like mixture of indian folk yeah but yeah I, I kind of dabble in that because a lot of a lot of people when a lot of the projects i mix are mainly indie all indie right stuff yeah or I'm we're moving on from that um next few questions what are three degrees that you'd have or you'd try to have if you didn't take audio Uh, computer programming. Okay. Computer programming. Um, culinary. Ooh. And jazz performance. Wait, not including anything music. Not Nothing music. music related. No music. Oh, okay. So com- uh, software engineering or computer programming, culinary, or um, architecture. Wow. Yeah. Definitely those ones. Uh. I, I love cooking. Um, yeah. Obviously not as good as some of the people that we know uh, who are really good at cooking. I'm yeah. looking at you, Rico. Um, yeah, that's a shout out to Rico, sure. by the way, because he helps me a lot with a lot of the cooking stuff. Um, oh, that's nice. He also I, helps I, out a lot of people, yeah. Yeah, and, I, and I, I just like doing it. I like the end result of it. I like watching people cook. I like learning what they do about it. Architecture, buildings fascinate me. Mm. I am, I've got this weird kind of thing for like building architecture where... It's one of the first things I notice about places where I enter. Mm. Um, and then after that, uh, what was the other thing? Software engineering. Just because yeah. it's like the most practical use of my sort of affinity for computers. Yeah. Yeah, those three. All right. In terms of music, in terms of career, where do you want to be in like five years? Uh, what do I want to be in five years? Yeah. Um, I think in five years, I think I'd be content with something like, I mean, just gigging. 
Um, mm. For me, as, as an aspiring session player, not necessarily being part, like getting out my own music, although I do want to do that at some point in mm. the near future. Um, but I, I, I like too many fields of music to be stuck in one. So yeah. I really like the idea of being a session player. I like the idea of exploring different genres and playing for different people. Mm. I like the idea of one day having to do like a, a rock gig and then the mm. next day going over into like a pop gig yeah. and then the next day doing a, doing like a funk number. Like that idea is really cool mm. for me because it helps yeah. me expand my own guitar yeah. playing, which is the end result of anything that I like to do. It's just yeah. to expand my own playing. So definitely in five years, I'd like to be a part of a couple of, of, of projects or like play consistently yeah. for a couple of projects and get out gigging. Yeah. Um, I was hoping to start on that gigging thing next year, but obviously that's been put on obviously hold. That's, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, but yeah, definitely that in, in five years at the very, at the very minimum. Otherwise having a place where I can afford my own space where I can modify it to like my thing. Cause if you can see right here, it's a nice space, but it's like in my living room. Cause I don't have anywhere yeah, else yeah, to put yeah. all this, like all this stuff. So I would like a, a, a nice a place where it's like a nice dedicated room. All right. Is there anything else you want to add on any topic that we've discussed? Uh, yeah, take end? it slow, guys. Take it slow for for everyone, for any for any for any field, for any mm. profession, for any musical calling, for any non musical calling. Take it slow. Yeah, take your take your time in figuring out something to perfection before moving on. Too many people move too fast because we only see end result stuff. Mm, yeah. Online, we only see the final result, and so we want that final result. Like I said, we will look at a piece of clothing online and say, "I want to design that," not knowing how many years it took just to get the coloration mm. correct, like the yeah. sense of coloration or the way that they block certain contours in the piece correctly. Mm. We don't see that stuff, um, but it's there and it exists and. If it was that easy to do, there'd be way too many famous people. Actually, there'd be no one famous if it was that <laughs> yeah, yeah. that easy to do. So take your time with everything. Um, in terms of musicianship, just practice like you. I'm a very, very avid believer in the metronome. Just practice yep. really slow. I'm also an avid believer of being really strict about yourself. If you cannot mm -hmm. play it at like a slower beat, uh, a slower BPM cleanly, there is no way in your mind that should tell you that you could play it at the original mm, yeah. BPM. It just doesn't make sense. Yeah. Um, I know some, cause I know some people have this mindset where like, Oh, but if I play it at original tempo, it sounds fine. Like, no, it doesn't. If you play it at the slow <laughs> tempo and you can't do it, you'll never be able to play it yeah, accurately yeah, yeah. at the, at the fast tempo. So, um, yeah, start slow and enjoy the process or do mm. your best to enjoy yeah. the process. Like for, for sure. me, practicing, practicing scales is fun for me, not because necessarily the scale is fun to play, but because I know the end result yeah. of what happens if I do practice this. Like I know what yeah. it sounds like at the end if I do practice this. So use that, use everything as inspiration and not necessarily as a comparison. All right. Um, to yeah. where you are. Yeah. Nick, thank you so much for joining. Thanks for this, the discussion on music, audio, craft, you know, discipline nope, actually doing something and trying to improve yourself i feel like that's a really important um thing we need to tackle as well you know um yes um our lives are not just based on the results we have sure you mm -hmm. know it's not based like that's not what has our values like that's not a value system in our lives but if you want to be good at something you gotta put the work in you know you gotta put the discipline in what you're saying sometimes you exactly. have to have a strict um schedule on when you practice, when you learn something new, and that's something oh, you have that, to be your worst. You yeah. have to be your worst critic. You have to be. Oh, your worst for critic. sure. I feel like that's something that's very important. This discussion is something that we need to have a bit more of. You know, of mm -hmm. the actual like, not just the follow your dreams, not just the you can do it, but the what's the process to get there? What are the steps you need? And what you mentioned was a really great point, which is you need to put the work in. You need to. There's copy. no shortcut. Yeah, there's, there's no, no shortcut. shortcut. You know, you need to copy sometimes. And then when you copy from that, make it, you know, evolve it. Yeah, don't it don't keep it at the copy. Um, I think that's a really important thing. Also, at the same time, there's just so much wisdom. And there's so much tips that you gave us regarding, you know, online media, learning. Oh my god, we talked for a while. We talked for a realize. long while. Nice. Nice. All right. So, Nick, thanks for coming on. Oh, no problem. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you find your podcasts. Also, click subscribe on YouTube if you're here. I'll see you next time.